The Game Boy Advance has always been one of my favorite handhelds. It has an amazing library of games and feels really comfortable in your hands. But these days when I play it, well, it's kinda hard to see the screen. And replacing these batteries is starting to hurt my wallet. Today we're gonna solve both those problems by installing a backlit screen and a USB-C rechargeable battery. We'll be assembling this mod from start to finish and showing off the various features of the screen. So if you're interested in having your GBA look like this, instead of this, then you're in the right place. Now let's get into it. To get started, I'll first introduce the components we're going to use, and I'll mention that I'm doing this mod for a friend who provided everything you see. This video isn't sponsored, but I'll still put some product links in the video description in case you're looking to do this mod yourself. So what we have here is the 3.0 IPS screen and the corresponding plastic liner, which I'll leave in the box for now. Next is the lithium ion battery, which comes with a charging board, a copper heat sink, and a battery lid already molded with an opening for the USB-C port. We're also going to replace the shell, and this one is designed to accommodate the new screen. Lastly, we have some new buttons and rubber membranes, and I think it's going to look really great in the end. So let's put it together and find out. We'll start by removing the exterior screws. There are six tri-wing and one crosshead under the battery lid. You can either use a Phillips or a JIS driver to remove this last one. With those screws out, the back shell half should lift up pretty easily to reveal the circuit board. We'll pull off the shoulder buttons, these side bumpers, and the power switch plate. I'll pull the latch on the screen connector to remove that cable, and then unfasten the crosshead screws holding the board down. In this case, there are only two screws, but sometimes there are three depending on the model. And now we can lift the board out. I'll remove all the buttons and rubbers, and they'll be replaced in this build, but if you're planning to reuse them or ever use them again, it's good practice to clean them all with soap and water. They'll take a number of hours to dry off, and it's important to do this next to a full bottle of apple juice. Along with the custom components, the main board is the only thing we'll need from the original GBA to complete this mod, so we'll make sure it's nice and clean using a toothbrush and isopropyl alcohol and I like to blow it off with canned air to dry it out a little faster. When we're happy with that, we can move the board aside and bring in the new shell half. Now we'll unpack the screen and admire it for a second. I lift up one corner of the protective film so it's easy to grab later, but still protects the screen while we're working on it. So it drops face down into the shell, and here I'm just checking to make sure I'll actually be able to get the film off later when things are assembled and it seems promising, so we move on, and shift our attention to the flex board, which is kitted with three prepared wires that we'll use to enable screen adjustments with the physical buttons on the GBA. Soldering these wires is optional, as the flex includes a touch sensor for the screen that can fully manage these settings as well. But come on, the wires are here, we're gonna use them. To get started soldering, we'll tin the three pads labeled L, R, and Select. Sorry, the camera focus gets a little wonky here, but hopefully you get the idea. Now I'll spin it over and start connecting the wires. If you're familiar with the channel, you already know I have shaky hands, and today was no exception. With that done, we'll pull out the main board for reference on the screen connector. We only need to use one of these flex tails, and which one depends on the model of the GBA. Visually, we see that only the larger one on the left is the appropriate size for this connector. So I'll insulate the side we're not using with polyimid tape to make sure there's no risk of shorting when it's assembled. I think the risk is really low, so consider this step optional. Now we can plug the cable into the main board, and we want the gold-plated pads facing up. I close the latch working side to side with the tweezers, just because the space is kind of tight on the left especially due to the link cable connector. When that's secure, we'll flip the board over and start connecting these wires. I'll start with the select wire, which needs to go to pad TP2 on the board. We'll feed the wire under the legs of this large IC to try to route it cleanly and provide a small amount of strain relief, and then solder it in place on TP2. The R wire is soldered to TP8, and the L wire is soldered to TP9. Here is a full view of the connection points for reference, and that's all the soldering we need to do for this project. Next, I'm folding over the unused flex cable so it doesn't get in the way when we assemble the shell. I'll tape it down starting at the wire solder joints to provide some strain relief there. 
Before we plug in the screen, we need to trim this plastic piece off the shell with a side cutter so that it doesn't interfere with the link cable connector. I'm not even sure why this extra plastic is here, so if there's a good reason for it and you know, let me know in the comments. Now this clear plastic liner for the screen needs to drop in like this, with the screen cable below it and the board cable above it. And for that reason, we have to feed the liner through the board cable before plugging in the screen. So we'll let the liner sit up there for now and then make the screen connection. With that, we can now adhere the touch sensor, which came with a double-sided adhesive already applied. So we can remove that liner and stick it down right about there. Yep, that seems right. Another optional step, but I decided to add a separate piece of double-sided adhesive to stick the flex cable to the back of the screen and keep it from moving around. I cut a fairly small piece so that it wouldn't be too difficult to remove later if we needed to. With that secure, we can lower the screen liner into place and add the new parts. I start out by putting in pretty much everything and then realize it's better to do the shoulder buttons and side bumpers after we fold the board in place. So I take those out and then lower the board down. And also the power switch plate gets in the way, so that should go in after as well. The speaker can be a little finicky, so I use my tweezers here to make sure it's seated properly in the shell. And I have to lift it back up because I forgot this LED polarizer for the power light, which just shoots in right above the B button. When the board feels like it's in the right spot, we can screw it down in place. Even though there were only two screws at the start, this time I'm using three because that's how many the kit came with. Now we can put the side bumpers and power switch plate back into place. And lastly, the shoulder buttons. On the other shell half, we need to unclip and remove the battery contacts since they'll get in the way and aren't needed for the new battery. Now we can place the back shell half and close this up by fastening the seven screws we removed at the start of the build. Moving on to the battery, it's not connected to the board yet, so we can take this cable and plug it in right here. It takes a decent amount of force to shove the battery into the compartment, but after moving it around a little bit, we eventually find a sweet spot and seat it into place. This cable needs to move out of the way, and maybe I could have tucked it under the board somehow earlier, but there's a convenient little cavity here that I'm just going to push it into with the tweezers. And that seems just fine. The heatsink is next, and it comes with an adhesive pad already on it, so we just remove the liner and stick it down. Easy peasy. Closing the battery cover takes a little bit of extra force compared to the original as well, but it's nothing too alarming, and the opening for the USB-C port seems to fit nicely. On to the finishing touches by applying the labels to the back. It's always a little tricky to get these aligned perfectly, and overall it went pretty well here except for a slight angle on the black label, but it's still within the alignment window, so not worth risking any damage by attempting to peel it up again. Anywho, the mod is complete, so let's peel off that protective film to reveal the screen. Oh wow, that looks great! I want to point out real quick that after filming I noticed a tiny piece of the protective film was stuck up in this corner. I did remove it after the fact, and now it does look great. Back to the video. So now we'll test it out and show off some of the features of this new IPS display. The display is looking really nice, and we have a decent amount of freedom for adjustments here. Holding down the select button brings up our menu. The first setting is brightness, there are 15 increments that we can cycle through by using the shoulder buttons. Personally, I think 12 or 13 looks the best in regular room lighting. To change the setting option, we can hold select again for about a second, and that brings us to the color adjustment. Cycling to number 2 looks like it just increases the exposure, number 3 is black and white, and number 4 is a green color that simulates the look of the original Game Boy. On the display setting, I think number 2 is anti-aliasing, but it's really hard to see a difference here on a screen of this size. Number 3 adds scan lines, which is pretty great and it looks much better in person than through my camera lens. The last setting is called frame blending, and it's used to properly display transparent objects designed for older displays on a modern one. I couldn't find a game that exemplified this well, but I would just recommend turning the setting on if you notice anything flickering on the screen. And here I was just checking what the green color with scan lines would look like. This is probably a cool option for original Game Boy games. I mentioned earlier that soldering was optional because instead of using the shoulder buttons, we can also adjust all these settings using the touch sensor. A long press on the bezel of the screen brings up the settings. Tapping the bezel functions like the R button to change the setting. Long pressing for a second changes the setting option. 
and a long press for a couple seconds closes the menu. I prefer using the buttons on the handheld for these adjustments, but the addition of the touch sensor is kind of genius because not everyone wants to solder, and with this, you don't even have to. Pretty neat stuff. Now I'll conveniently use my everyday phone charger to make sure this handheld has a full battery before giving it back to my friend. This thing turned out great and it was a really fun project. I'm looking forward to the next one, and I'll see you then.